Right, so this video is going to look at paper chromatography. This is another separation technique, similar in that sense to distillation, uh, crystallization, and filtration, but it's a little bit different in that when you carry out paper chromatography, you do not end up with these separate parts of the mixture in separate beakers, for example, or containers or whatever. Instead, it's an analysis technique which allows you to take a mixture and separate it out using the chromatography and then analyze what is present based on that. So it's a little bit different, but it is still a separation technique all the same. Um, the general setup for a paper chromatography experiment looks a little bit like this. Now, as you can see, we've got a general setup here. This big container here, although not labeled, is a beaker. Inside that, we put some solvent. We add a piece of chromatography paper. We draw a line in pencil. We add a dot of our chemical, and then we put a lid on and allow this thing to run. A few key points here, and this is something you've done back in year seven, perhaps. It's a very, very simple, practical, very simple experiment, one of the required practicals as well. Um, what we've got is when we have our paper chromatography, in this case, my piece of paper is floating. Normally, you'd have it attached to something at the top here or, or however, or you might have it touching the bottom. Key thing is that the solvent, and I'll come back to these terms, mobile and stationary phase in a moment, but the solvent must be below the line. The reason is if the solvent is above the line, it will simply dissolve the chemical from the line, and that we don't want. We need the solvent to be below the line so it is then able to move up the paper. The dot of chemical we place on a pencil line, and this is very important as well. The pencil line, well, it must be drawn in pencil. Do not draw it in pen. The reason is that as the solvent comes up, the pen may then also run up here, and that therefore ruins the chromatography experiment. So we have a line in pencil because that will not dissolve solvent below the line. Essentially, what goes on here is that once we've set this up correctly, the solvent moves up the paper, just like that, and provided that this is a good solvent uh, in so much that it will dissolve the chemical here, only some solvents will dissolve things. Water, for example, wouldn't be very good if this was a dot of Sharpie because the water wouldn't dissolve the Sharpie. If I used ethanol or acetone or propanone, it would. So we make sure we've got a good solvent there, but assuming the solvent is good, it moves up this paper, and as it does so, when it touches this chemical, the chemical dissolves. What happens then is as the solvent moves up the paper, so does the chemical, and it will come up and up and up and up and up. And what we'll find is that if this is a mixture of different chemicals, we will end up seeing different dots appear up the paper. If this was only one chemical here was pure, what we would actually see then is we'd see perhaps only one dot present on the paper. Key thing though is that this will move up as the solvent spreads. Now there are two key phrases or words I should say, well they are phrases I guess, to look at and this is the term stationary phase and the term mobile phase. Now in terms of the English there they are quite straightforward in terms of what they mean. The term mobile phase this denotes something that moves and the stationary phase is something that stays still. In this case and in all cases of paper chromatography the solvent, the thing doing the dissolving that is going to move up the paper. This is the mobile phase. It moves. The stationary phase, in this case paper chromatography, is the paper itself. But this needn't be the case in different types of chromatography, gas chromatography for example. This could be a solid. It can also be a very thick gloopy liquid. So it doesn't really matter. The key thing is it's something that essentially doesn't move. It stays stationary. Key thing here is that when our solvent moves up and it hits our chemical, this chemical dissolves and moves into the mobile phase as it moves up. But then exists an equilibrium of sorts in that the chemical, the mixture of chemicals, they exist in the mobile phase and in the stationary phase going back and forward. Now, different chemicals, assuming that this is a mixture, different chemicals will spend more time in the mobile and or the stationary phase. And because of that, as the solvent moves up, because there are differing amounts of time spent in the mobile and the stationary phase, we then see, oh, this one comes out here, this one comes out here, and this one comes out here. And that's because they spend different amounts of time in each one of these phases. And the reason for that is this, the solvent dissolves the chemicals. So depending on how soluble 
those chemicals are depends on how much time they will spend in the mobile phase. A very soluble chemical will spend lots of time in the mobile phase. A not so soluble chemical will spend less time in the mobile phase. It also depends on the stationary phase. A chemical that is quite strongly attracted to the stationary phase will spend more time in that and the opposite, a chemical which is less attracted will spend less time in that. So for something to move further up, this one here for example, we could say that this one here has spent more time in the mobile phase and less time in the stationary phase compared to these. This could mean therefore that it is less attracted to stationary phase which I'm going to call SP and it's more soluble in mobile phase which I'm going to call MP and the opposite then would be true for this down here because it has come out there lots earlier so this is this idea in general terms kind of from paper one perspective looking at AQA they expect you to have a general understanding of how chromatography works paper two looks at this analysis idea here which is more talking about the stationary and the mobile phase and then there is one more bit to look at which is these terms RF uh, values and how we can use those to further and better analyze a chromatography experiment so if this is a chromatogram, the outcome, the product of a chromatography experiment, and I find that my dot here is dissolved and I'm left with a dot here and a dot here. Now I've given the distances that these dots have moved, okay? And I'm saying that these dots have moved 2.2 centimeters and 5 centimeters respectively. Now, what I can do is I can use this finished chromatogram to actually make some calculations and to analyze what possibly is present here. And I can do that using something called an RF value. Now RF values are very, very easy to calculate. We take the distance moved by the dot and we divide that by the distance moved by the solvent. Now in my case here, and this is completely out of scale, but it works really, really nicely um, in terms of the, the maths. I'm going to say my solvent has traveled 10 centimeters. So for this first dot here, its RF value would be 2.2 divided by 10, 0.22. This one here, its RF value would be 5 divided by 10, 0.5. So I've now got these numerical values for these dots here. Now on their own, those aren't very useful. They don't tell me much at all. They have to be used in conjunction with known values. So I could pull out a big old data book, which has loads and loads of values, and provided I match up the correct solvent with the one I've used in this particular experiment, let's say I used water for this, and I look in my book and I find the water values, and I see, right, what's got this? Ah, this chemical had a value of 0.22, so it could be this, or this chemical had a value of 0.5 in my book, so this could be what it is. So that's one way of doing it. I can make comparisons to known values. If, though, I thought that in my chemical, in my mixture that I started with, if I thought there was a particular chemical present, I could also run another chromat uh, chromatography experiment with that chemical which is now known to me. Now, if I ran that experiment and I found that that chemical gave me a value of 0.22, well, then I could compare those two chromatography experiments, those two chromatograms, and say, actually, look, this would be the same. Now, in an ideal world, I would use a number of different solvents, and I would do that, because each time we use a different solvent, we are potentially going to get a different value. So different solvents will give different values for the RF. So I want to use a range of solvents with my unknowns versus my known to make those comparisons. And if those values match up, I can safely say, yes, that is the substance that I think it is. If those values do not match up, then I can't say that. Often in an exam, they will give you, uh, or they have done in the past, they've given you something like a chroma uh, chromatogram. They've got you to take some measurements, and then they've given you a table of known RF values and said which is the right one. And it's a, simply a case of matching those two things up. So, there you go, a separation technique with a little bit of a twist. 
chromatography, paper chromatography, uh, linking the RF values, hopefully that makes some sense.